Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Diving Deep here, Pro Talk Outdoor style, and it's uh, September, and for that, uh, that means a lot of you guys maybe have started your hunting seasons, whether it's out west chasing some elk, mule deer, pronghorn, early season whitetails, or in Kentucky, uh, as we have been uh, hunting some early season whitetails, season's kicked off, so um, you wanted to... Uh, to bring back an episode we we recorded a while back in the summer, but it's very much relevant to where we're at today, and uh, and that's on public land. And uh, Jason Campbell, who is a a great friend of our group and uh, and a contributor, does a lot for us and uh, <clears throat> just a tremendous hunter, great outdoorsman, great individual all the way around. Um, we recorded a podcast with Jason uh, discussing uh, what he was doing on public lands, and it's very much relevant. Because uh, opening opening day in Kentucky, uh, Wyatt and Jason went down and and uh, hunted some public ground in Kentucky and and did their homework and Jason was able to harvest his uh, first ever public uh, public velvet deer uh, in the state of Kentucky. So uh, wanted to go ahead and roll out this podcast and uh, hope you enjoy it. I know I learned a lot from Jason and the time I talked to him about public land hunting and I think you will as well. So here we go. We're gonna dive deep with Jason Campbell. Public Land Whitetails. Welcome back to Pro Talk Outdoors. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, folks. <laughs> How is everybody? What kind of can I Can I interest you in a car outside? <laughs> we got plenty of cars out there for sale. Wyatt is trying to sell cars. Anyway, <coughs> all right, Pro Talk Outdoors, we're uh, here with another Diving Deep episode. I uh, feel like we've done a lot of really good Diving Deep episodes, Wyatt. We've had some great content, great guests. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think to uh, I think today we'll follow suit. Yeah, without a doubt. Today it's going to be another guest that uh, may not be a household name yet. Yeah. It's going to be at some point in time. i got a feeling. But... Uh, Jason Campbell, a good friend of uh, yours for many years, Wyatt. Yes. And a good friend of mine lately. I feel like we're really tight now after uh, we shared a blind in turkey season. Oh, and we got We got to know each other really well. But uh, Campbell's doing some really interesting things hunting some public ground. He absolutely is, yeah. And, and we're going to dive into it today, talking about that and just talking about hunting and things in general, uh, but specifically focusing in on what he's doing on public land and how he's breaking some of those properties down and, and kind of that whole process. So let's uh, let's roll in and talk to Jason. Yeah, let's do that. Hey, guys, what's going on? Not much, buddy. So, all right, tell uh, introduce yourself. Tell everybody, um, you know, kind of, kind of what, how you started hunting, um, you know, why you hunt, things like that. Well, uh jason campbell like you all said uh been good friends with wyatt here ever since i moved here in uh what third grade third grade so uh really uh background hunting i had absolutely none before i met him um him and his family are kind of the ones responsible for me uh getting into this um yeah you know, i've been hunting with him since god i can't even remember when i remember the first time we ever went you know it was just it was me you and your dad yeah and uh that was probably what fifth, sixth grade. Fifth, sixth grade, yeah. yeah. And me and you didn't didn't even have anything, and he just took us out there. I think he was still using a stick bow at the time. Yeah, he hunted with one for quite a quite a while. Um, how? When did he quit? When did he quit shooting uh, traditional? What were we? Uh, probably sixteen. Probably so. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, he just took us out there, and me and you just kind of sat on the ground under a tree, and uh, he went off and climbed up in a stand and. Man, we didn't see a single deer, but ever since then, I just I've been hooked ever. Didn't since. matter, did it? Didn't, no. didn't matter, man. Just being out there, that 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 did it for me. And then uh, I guess I killed my first deer with a muzzle loader, and I was probably fourteen or fifteen then. Yeah. Same thing. Me and you just sitting on the ground, and your dad up in a tree stand behind us, and had that little six point come in, and uh, then got got into bow hunting then. Uh, yeah, when did you you got your first bow when you were fifteen, I think? Yeah, when was I was right? fifteen, yeah. sixteen. You bought that yeah, somewhere Matthews, in there. Uh, no, oh. you had a. It was before that because you had that. What was that like? That, a, that team, team Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. Yeah, PSC <laughs> Team Fitzgerald. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Had that. Never killed a deer with it, man. Uh, I think I shot at one, and shot right under it. 
and then moved up to the Matthews LX. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, killed that real nice wide eight point. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, dude. That, yeah, that, that was, was a, the first deer I ever killed with my bow. I think he was twenty four and a half inside. Twenty four and a half. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, the I mean, funniest just, thing about that was, man, I remember the day before who. One of your dad's friends, right around the corner, we went and looked at that deer he shot, and it was wide. Oh, who was it, that? I, it was right on the way to Vols's over there, on that same road. Oh, it was Frank Monk. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was, was like, Monk, I was like 22 yeah. or something. We came out of there. I was just joking around with you. said, man, I'm going to kill one wider yeah, than that. And yeah, it was the next yeah. morning went out, and I shot that one. Yeah, that was uh that was a that was a wild morning, dude. I mean, just every you shot that deer. I was hunting over at a different property. You and my dad were over there in that area. You shot that deer. I saw some pretty nice bucks that morning coming in. We saw that nice uh, that yep. other nice eight pointer, yep. uh, or actually coming back in to get to get your deer out. Saw the other nice eight pointer. That was. Do you remember the date of that? Was that November eighth? Well, before. I've got to know. I want. I want to hear that story. Actually, uh, Campbell, break that story down on how that hunt went down, and and obviously that was a good day. So I mean, talk a little bit about what, what was I think, going on that day. I think it was the eighth, wasn't it? Ninth. 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 Okay. Ninth. Okay. Yep. Uh, November ninth. I don't know. It was just one of those things. Me and uh, me and your dad went over to went over to Vols' place, and you know he kind of gave me a general idea. Hey, go into here, and man, back then I didn't know anything. I just went in, found a tree put the old stand on it climbed up it and i don't remember i didn't see anything all morning and he said are you about ready to go it's about 10 i said let's give it another half hour hour you know yeah just enjoying being out there and hear something coming through the woods and it was a doe and i mean like i said i'd never shot anything with my bow before so i drew back on the doe and uh hear something behind her and here he come you know hot on her trail and so I was drew back. I was probably full draw for about a minute waiting for him to follow her. And perfect shot on him right through the heart. Don't know how I did it, but I did. And uh, he probably didn't go 50, 60 yards. I don't know why I didn't see him drop. And But, yeah, it was a great morning. And uh, <laughs> that son of a bitch broke my arrow. I remember taking <laughs> Yeah, I heard That's what he said. It was so funny. When we, when we were tracking him, he found half the, you know, like three quarters radioed, of his arrow or I something. I radioed your dad. I said, yeah. uh, or that's I what it I was. shot one. And uh, I got down, found my arrow. I said, that son of a bitch broke my arrow. <laughs> <laughs> and that, was a, <laughs> that was the first thing he said when I went up and met him at the truck. He said, Campbell, would you say that son of a bitch broke my arrow? <laughs> yeah. Said, yeah, I did. It made me mad at the time, but. Oh shoot, man! We walked up we've, on them. And, we've broke a lot of arrows since then. We've yeah. broken a lot of arrows before that. Maybe just not shooting deer, but uh, no, that was a that was a really good morning. And just uh, you hunted with my dad quite a bit. I mean, like when I couldn't go, yeah. things like that. I mean, you spent a lot of time in the woods, just you know, with my dad. And, and probably the reason that he kept taking you was because of what you just said. You said give it another half hour because I mean, you know him. He'll set till, you know, he'll set all day. Yeah, right. You know, and given I mean, given the right conditions and. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's uh, he. He's always been good about you know. If people are interested, he'll he'll show you what's going on. So it was a that was a heck of a morning, heck of a morning. And then all right, so from there, so then you hunted a couple more years, and then you killed that really big eight pointer right uh, across the road here. Tell us about that one. Yeah, that, that it was a. Uh... I believe that was the last October. That might have been October 30th, I think. I think I it was. or it, it was either 30th or 31st. They were yeah. just starting to get up on their feet and cruise. Just starting to get up on their feet. And uh, like I said, just, I didn't do anything anything back then. It was just basically me walking around and picking Finding a tree some scrapes. And, and, yeah, picking yeah. a tree and climbing up. And uh, the farm I was hunting uh, belonged to our neighbor. I helped him out quite a bit, got permission to hunt it. And just little bits and pieces of patch woods here and there. And uh, it was morning, climbed up, and wasn't seeing a whole lot of anything. And heard a heard a twig break behind me. I turned around, and I mean, it was just a real nice eight. Probably. Hammer, hammer of an eight. I was a day yeah. seen them over at my place, and you know, just it probably wasn't 15 seconds. I saw him grab my bow, turn around, got drew back, and shot him. And uh, the thing that sticks out in my mind most about that hunt is actually after the hunt. Um, you know, you you were out hunting somewhere else. Your dad was hunting. Somewhere I was working else. that morning. I was working at the archery shop. You hadn't gone in yet. though. Oh, I hadn't gone in yet. You okay, hadn't gone in yet. And uh, I remember coming back to your place just because that's where I lived during deer season. You know, <laughs> and uh, I remember just hanging out with Becky, your mom. Yeah. 
and you know telling her about it and I remember her cutting up little pieces of ribbon or something. So <laughs> yeah, so we for could tracking. Track her. Yeah. And uh, I remember me and Becky went out by ourselves after probably about an hour and a half, and we found that deer together. She's actually the one that found him. Yeah. You know, following, yeah. and I'm looking for blood, and she's just, Jason, is that it right there? And sure enough, it was laying in the thicket yeah. in there. She was always good about going out and. I loved and, it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and loved and it. helping. Yeah, that's, that's probably that. That's what sticks out in my mind most about that hunt. So tell us about. All right, so that's some of your earlier hunting and stuff like that. And so tell us about how things have kind of evolved for you um, throughout your years of hunting. Those were your first couple of bucks. You've killed several other bucks um, and, and does and everything else. But, you know, what have you learned over the years? And then kind of break that into, like, what you're doing now and what, I guess, gave you that desire to, to move toward public land. Was it a challenge thing? You only bow hunt. So obviously there's a challenge element there. Right. You know, I mean, you don't even turkeys or anything. Uh, we were in Kentucky this year, and Dave was begging him. He's like, "Take a bu- or take a gun." It was on the last day. Yeah, I mean, we're down there just for a couple of days, you know, on this this turkey hunt in Kentucky, and um, and I'm hunting with Campbell. We had a blast. I mean, just it really enjoyed uh, the time we spent there in the blind, and and it gets down to uh, pretty much the last morning we can hunt or anything, and I'm like, uh, Campbell, take my gun. You know, I took my gun down there just in case, and. He's like, no, no, I don't think so. Uh, just don't feel right about it. It's not what I want to do. I want to take my bow. And, you know, I said, okay, yeah, you know, I'm with that. That's good. Yeah, personal preference, man. If you're not, I mean, the thing is, if you're if you're going to shoot something in, with a gun and it not mean anything to you, then what's the point of shooting right. I mean, I've got nothing against gun hunting at all or, or guns. You know, I've got. Yeah, oh, hunting. yeah, you're a huge, we all are. I mean, you're a huge Second Amendment it, it uh, just, supporter. It doesn't do anything for me, you know. I mean, I've shot, I, sh- I think I've shot two deer with my gun and one yeah. turkey and uh but ever since i shot that first buck with my bow i just i haven't picked up a gun to hunt anything right you know, just the rush is nothing well and i think it, i think it's kind of the whole game you know that you're you are at the top of your game when you get within range of a of a critter with a bow right you know with a gun sometimes you don't always have that you have that feeling you're like oh okay yeah you know, I right. got within a hundred or two hundred yards of them or whatever. No, I, I get that. Yeah, it 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 definitely. It always blows my mind with like some of these people that you know that gun hunt and stuff. Um, like on opening weekend, and that's all they do is just gun hunt, and like they're out there for an hour, and then they kill their deer, and that's they're, it. They're and missing, then they're missing so much of the season. Yeah, and I mean, then you got three weeks compared to you know bow season you get almost three three whole months. You know, yeah, you can be out there exactly, and I just can't imagine. I would hate it. I mean, I shot that deer this year on, what was it, October 23rd, I think, or 24th, 23rd, I think. I'd have to look at my uh, date book. But uh, it was miserable for me, like, the rest of the year. I was like, gosh, I'm done. I'm done. I can't imagine being the being the person that goes out on opening morning of gun season with a gun, shoots a deer in the first hour, and then season's over, and that's the only, you spent one hour in the woods the entire deer season that was like that the last buck i shot i shot at opening weekend i remember that yeah and yeah that that was that was a rough rest of the year yeah man i understandably so all right so tell us tell us uh what evolved into you doing some of the public land stuff i mean that's what we really want to talk about the public land stuff uh maybe i'm a glutton for punishment i don't know uh no honestly uh necessity more than anything um you know, I've got a couple of small private properties that I can hunt. And, you know, we recently moved last year. And I could either drive an hour and hunt the same 40-acre properties over and over and burn those things out in the first week. Or I could drive 20 minutes and have access to thousands of acres of public land. Right, right. So, I mean, it was So, kind of okay, open. so you're talking about that and burning out those those 40-acre plots. You did that. I mean, Absolutely. right? I mean, for a couple of years, like just you know, absolutely. Talk about being a glutton for punish, yeah. punishment. Yeah, I mean, I mean, going out and hunting the same places. Those deer know you're in there. You know, the first time you walk in there, they know it. Yeah, and you know they're going to get wise to it. Deer aren't stupid at all, and um, you know I'm learning that a lot more this year. Um, just you know, when I first told White, I was thinking about doing public land stuff. He said, "Uh, hey, you need to you need to check this guy out, Dan Infault." And uh, he's the man, isn't he? He he's the man. He's something, all right. But yeah, that guy is so knowledgeable about yep. deer behavior, 
and hunting pressured deer. And I remember the first time you said something about it. We were actually over here, and you put a video on. And uh, the first thing I remember is seeing him sitting there talking, and he had a T-shirt on saying, uh, world's best farter. <laughs> yeah, that was scratched out. It said <laughs> father. Funny. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my first thought was, what are you what, watching? What in the world have you got me watching? <laughs> But, I mean, you listen to this guy talk for five minutes, and yeah. it'll blow your mind. Yep, yep. Well, it, and I think it just, I think it connects a lot of dots. Right. And you know, I mean, because I, mean, I know, like, uh, when when I started paying attention to some of the stuff that he said, you know, talking about specifically, you know, bucks in hill country, and not necessarily, well, I guess the way that they travel, but the way that they bed, too, but specifically the way they travel, you know, I can I can think of a couple different spots where it really put the pieces together for me, to where I was like, okay, it's, I knew where those bucks were going to be, but it wasn't necessarily consistent. So then I started following wind charts and things like that, and 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 putting those things together, and then all the pieces fell into a puzzle. You know, all the pieces of the puzzle fell together, and you know now it's just calling your shots. It's like, which hill am I going to hunt? Let me look at the wind. I can tell you where I'm going to be instead of you know looking at. 10 or 12 different stands and saying, oh, well, you know, I saw a good one there, but the conditions have completely and totally changed yesterday, you know, and so I'm going to go back there because I saw a good one there the day before, but the conditions are completely different. That's not always that. That's, I'm not saying that that's a bad plan from time to time, but there's a lot better plans. Right. You know, I mean, and by, and by those deer, especially, especially pressure deer, they're going to quarter into the wind, they're going to walk into the wind, you know, something. They're going to make a J-hook when they come back into bed. You know, they're going to bed in certain areas where they can um, smell what's behind them, see what's in front of them, you know, on some of those higher knobs, you know, things like that. I mean, it, it's just, it it just, it makes things a lot more precise, and you're not wasting nearly as much time with guesswork. You're putting yourself in a position to where you have an opportunity every time that you step into the woods. Right, definitely. And, uh, one of the big things I've been concentrating on this year is kind of his whole method of hunting that he does is finding their buck beds. Where are they living? You know, um, I guess I'm, I've kind of been telling myself that, yeah, I'm transitioning. I'm not so much a, a deer hunter anymore as I am going after mature bucks. Right. You know, and it... Well, and you've been that way for the last several years. Right, but, I mean, right, but it's just, it's, yeah. Things like the whole style of hunting is changing for me. You know, I'm not just going and finding finding the sign they're putting down or, you know, setting up on their trails. You know, I'm actually looking for specifically mature buck beds and trying to get in there as close as I can to them. That way I can catch them on their feet in daylight hours. Well, especially on public land like that. I mean, because, you know, they're not going to move far. I mean, a buck, you know, I, I don't buy into, you know, a buck will lay stagnant um, all day, you know, throughout October or any other time. I don't think that they lay in one spot all day once it's daylight. I oh, think they get up and they yep. mill around yep. a little bit, but they might not leave an area bigger than 20 yards. Especially, like, dealing with wind shifts and stuff like that, you know, yep. that they're going to bed dependent on that wind. Absolutely. And so if the wind changes in the middle of the day. so Okay, so break that down. Tell people how they're going to bed with the wind. Okay. So give us, like, uh, give us an example. Like, say, like, a west wind. A west wind, generally what you're going to see is uh, the bucks are going to go in, When's he going to J-hook into his bed, and he's going to go in there, lay down with his back towards the wind, and look down his trail that he came down. Yep. So, you know, he's got the wind coming over his back, so he's going to smell anything trying to come in behind him, and he's going to be able to look out in front of him and see anything trying to come down from that way. So what's he going to do if the wind does a complete and total 180 shift to east wind? During the time while, where where he's when he's bedded down, and it completely and totally shifts to the east, so now it's hitting him in the face. What's he gonna do? Generally, he's gonna either. It depends if that bed he is in is set up to where he can just turn around and face the other way, or if he has to, he's gonna go to another bed. Right, which is gonna be within within with, pretty with, yeah, close within, proximity. Within close proximity to the areas he, he's in. I mean, he's not gonna get up and he's not gonna move 400 yards to another bed. Generally. When they have an area that they feel safe in, they're going to have numerous beds in that area for and, any wind. And that's something that you've witnessed. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the areas I've been, I've been concentrating mostly on type wetland type areas this year. I've been in the hills a little bit, but, um, you know, they're just trying to get to where people don't go. And generally, anywhere with water. Uh, people don't like crossing water for whatever reason, you know. 
and so you find somewhere it's cut off or you know underwater or anything like that that's 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 a place deer can go a big deer can go in there and live in there and really not have to worry about people well i mean as a whole big big bucks especially by the time our season comes comes in uh october 1st i mean they're a solitary animal you know for that whole month of october Mm -hmm. for the for the most part i mean and that's not a that's not a hard rule but you know i mean you think back about it think do you generally see big bachelor groups of of nice size bucks together no no you don't no no once once, yeah they don't they don't bed with the duck they generally don't don't want to be messed with by any. And other they're people. not bed. I mean, they're not bedding with the does yet. You know, or right. within close proximity of the does yet. I mean, you know, a little, a little island or a little ridge, you know, or hump or whatever you want to call it, out in the middle of a swamp, is the per- absolute perfect place for a big buck to bed. You know, I mean, he he has uh, he has one. He's got water there, but he's got the safety, and he has the safety of the water because water brings safety to a big buck like that. Absolutely. I mean, when's the last time you saw a coyote out in a marsh? <clears throat> yeah, or a person, or a person, correct for that matter. Except besides yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, except for you. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, there's a, there's a couple places I'm in. I've got a you know a three hour paddle back on the kayak. I mean, it's four and a half miles from the nearest ramp to get back in there. Yeah. And I mean. Coming from the other way, you're going to have a half-mile walk. You're going to have to cross a ditch. It's about chest-deep in water. And then another half-mile walk back to this marsh. And no sign of people back there whatsoever. And you walk back through there, and there's just beds and trails all over the place. There's a reason for that. There is a reason for that. They they know they can live back there pretty much undisturbed. So, all right, so what's your approach? My approach is going to be getting back there... Uh, on a kayak and trying to basically the first couple sits or first sit I should say is going to be observation you know just finding out you know are they in the beds that I found earlier in the year all right so so describe an observation set what are you going to do 100 yards off 200 yards off as far away as you can see it's basically I'm going to try to be as close as I can without being in them detected yeah uh, somewhere where I can see quite a bit of that area and find out if they're where I think they are. You know, the beds I found early in the year. If they are, then I'm going to move right in on them. I mean, I'm going to try to get within probably 70 yards. Next day? Next cold front? Next uh, available wind change? I mean, Whenever what, the conditions are the same as that day. Because, you know, if it's a different wind... Then they're going to bed in a different area. They'd be in a different place. Yeah. I got this question, Jason. So, okay, you're hunting public ground, and you've already found, I think you've said this maybe to us, I can't remember, but several, several buck beds. You know, I mean, just... How many? Yeah, how many have you found? That's that's a tough question. I've pro- anywhere from, I'd say, probably 50 to 60. Okay, so 50 to 60 buck beds, and you're hunting, there's several thousand acres available there that you're getting off the beaten path where other guys aren't going so will you be taking more risks than you normally would if you were hunting say that 40 acre parcel of private ground that you have because you know say you say you observe something you said you're going to move right in and try to hunt and try to go for the kill right away you can kind of do that a little bit because if you happen to blow that one little area out you've got a lot of other areas to fall back on right right definitely um I'm going in with the mentality that I'm either going to kill a deer here, or, or I'm you're going to hunt, hunt a different deer the next yeah. day. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've I've got so many different areas that I've been to, and you know, I'm I don't plan on hunting the same area probably more than two or three times in a year, and I think that might even be too much for them. So if I don't if I don't see something I like that day, and think I have a chance to get in there and kill it, or I don't kill anything, then I'm just moving on. Yeah, I like that approach personally. So, you know, it's going to keep me moving. I'm not going to be the same spots every day. And it's going to keep me from getting burned out on them. Well, and it also, it, it makes your whole season alive. I mean, you're in play every day. I mean, because take me, for example. I, I hunt a lot, and, and I hunt a lot of days. But, you know, I've told Dave this before, and you know this. My most valuable tool that I have is a pair of binoculars. Because I would say, let's say, until gun season, let's say, you know, that's middle of November. Our season opens October 1st here in Indiana. I bet I honestly don't hunt where I I think that I'm going to have an opportunity to kill a deer 
more than five times. Now, I might be out in the woods, well, not actually out in the woods, but I'll, I'll be on the edge of a field. Well, I mean, I do a ton of observation sets doing that, trying to get visual confirmation of what's going on and, and kind of, you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together that way. And I typically have a, you know, have a bow with me. But a lot of times I'm not, I'm not quote unquote hunting as far as like I feel like I'm in the game, you know, because right. I'm just, I'm just sitting back waiting for the right time. You know, and with you, you're in the game every time that you go out because of all these options that you have. Exactly. Every every time I go out there, I'm planning on killing. Them. Right. Right. And and you know, I this probably is not a tactic to apply if you're if you're on a lease with other people or or you're on a small parcel or anything like that because because of the risk that you're taking. I mean, it's just it's not it's not a smart play necessarily on on uh, private ground. As far as like you know, if it's smaller, if you if you want to be able to hunt it more, it's not a smart play because right. I mean you're taking a tremendous amount of risk. But if you're willing to put the put the work into it and find a bunch of this public ground and find all these buck beds like you have, that's a pretty good option. Definitely is, and like like you said, you know, I probably wouldn't recommend this for somebody on private ground, you know, especially a smaller parcel because if you try this, you know, you're gonna bump deer. It's gonna happen. You know, you're not gonna be able to get as close as you need to without bumping deer and if you're not bumping deer occasionally then you're you're not going to be in the game you know because a lot of times these bucks they'll get up you know the last hour daylight and kind of just you know meander around and they probably Mm -hmm. won't move a hundred yards in shooting light so if you're not within that hundred yard range of them then you're out of the game i mean you might see them but you're probably not going to get a shot at them yeah yeah, no, that makes that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think that that's – I think even deer that are unpressured, you know, in certain times of the season, I mean, they don't move a tremendous amount during right. the Right, you're not going to see a big buck get up in the, in the evening and move 300 yards to a food source in light. It's just – it's not it, it, yeah yeah you're you have extremely unpressured deer or you know you've got the perfect front something like that if if right. some if With, if, if one does that are right then yeah they'll, they'll they'll get up and move but they're gonna have to be just right exactly whereas with your tactic you're taking subpar days i mean it might be 80 degrees and you can apply this tactic and the deer you know the deer's still gonna get up right. you know i mean it's like what we were talking about earlier they're not gonna lay there there the entire day until dark or at least i don't think I, I, I personally don't think that deer do that. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I know the deer that I watch bed down. And it's funny, um, you know, this year I was I was hunting on the edge of a hill, and um, I was I was with Kelly, my wife, and we had a little uh, three-year-old come in. It, it was uh, just, it was, I think it was opening opening day of gun season. And uh, we had a little three-year-old come in, and he uh, he bedded down, and the wind was swirling where we were. It, was, it, it wasn't... It wasn't ideal. Um, we were up high enough and on the edge of the hill to where it wasn't that big a deal. I mean, we weren't getting busted, but the wind down there was swirling. I was dropping milkweed and stuff like that, and it was just it was going everywhere. But we had, we had high pressure and a pretty strong wind, and and uh, so so we were okay where we were. But this buck, every time that the wind would swirl, he'd get up and he'd rotate which way he was bedded. You know, I mean, every time, and I'm sitting there pointing. I'm like, look at this, look at this. She's like, this is unbelievable. She goes, why does he keep getting up? I said, because the wind's swirling. You know, I mean, it'd be 10 minutes, and he'd get up, and he'd move five feet. Then he'd turn around, you know, the opposite direction or whatever. It's pretty, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's little stuff like that, and it doesn't necessarily have to be big deer that we're paying attention to when we're out there in the woods. And, you know, it could be a fawn, it could be a doe, whatever, but, but you know, pay attention. Pay attention to that type of stuff, because that's going to, once you see a deer bedding, like, okay, for, like, that ridge, okay, so it was a uh, foul, or south foul. <laughs> stupid uh south facing slope and uh we had a predominant um north north wind that day so he came down and bedded bedded on that on that slope he had the wind going over his back well it was it was squirrely but my i guess what my point is you know by paying attention to that then you can you can okay you're like okay okay i see which way he's bedding i see the wind direction everything like that now i can think about every place else on the farm and put the pieces together as to where other deer are going to be bedded as well. My biggest piece of advice on stuff like that is when you see something like that, ask yourself why. Yes. You know, I mean, 
Right. That, I, that's. I guess. Yeah. That was a lot simpler yeah. way to say what I just said. I kind of bumbled around right then. The, ask yourself, why is this happening? And, and it can be with numerous things. I mean, you can. You're you're watching deer and they're feeding in one specific area. Why are they feeding there? What are they eating? You know, acorns. Oh, okay. You know, what type of acorns? Is it a chinkapin? Is it a white oak? Is it a bur oak? You know, what is it? What are, what are they? You know, what are they focusing in on? Yeah. Whenever you observe deer behavior. I'm constantly asking myself, why is this deer doing that? And even, you know, that that's a that's a very good point and something on private land. Now, this won't necessarily um, apply to you because you're going to be hunting a different deer basically every day of the season. But something that I always try to pay a lot of attention in, on in the summer, in the fall, anytime. Anytime I'm glassing, doing an observation set, whatever, if there's a buck that I'm specifically interested in, and maybe he's a four-year-old, maybe he's a five-year-old, maybe he's older, maybe he's a two- or three-year-old, but you think he's going to be a stud, I watch his language with other deer. And, I, you know, because it's going to tell you, is he a bully buck? Is he is he brave? Is he more likely to come to a call? Is he really shy? Is he always solitary and by himself and hang away from the other bucks? You know, is he constantly messing with does? You know, what's his deal, deal with that? And even maybe it's an older buck that you're not interested in, in shooting, maybe because of rack or, or, or whatever. I mean, somebody's reason is. But that will tell you. Hey, is let's just we'll use a deer that Kelly killed a few years ago. For example, we called him the goat. Um, he was just a big, nasty seven pointer, and uh, we get one tag in Indiana, and there was a few of us who were like, "Man, I don't know if we want to shoot him or not," you know. So we'd passed him for a few different years. He's super aggressive deer, and uh, my sister and Kelly were both trying to shoot him, and uh, uh, Kelly ended up ended up killing him. But the, the I guess the, my point is, he was incredibly aggressive, and he was a bully buck, and he was pushing a ton of other bucks off of our property. So that's why we were really adamant about trying to get somebody to shoot him. Because once he was gone, then he, I mean, he was pushing out a couple of dandy three-year-olds and four-year-olds and stuff like that, and she killed him at seven and a half. But I mean, you know, just by paying attention to that and observing the different behavior of your of your deer herd and kind of watching how it coexists with each other. You know, uh, maybe there's a little spike or a little forkhorn that always runs with a big buck. You know, I mean, you know when you see him that that other deer's probably in close proximity and you're kind of, you know, you're kind of in the mix. Or maybe you're getting some camera pictures or something of him and you're thinking, oh, okay, well, what happened to that deer? I'm not seeing him. Well, maybe he's just been avoiding the camera and that other deer, you know, has stepped out in front of it. I mean, there's just there's just a lot of things that goes to your point of just ask why and what's happening out there and trying to pay attention to those little fine details. And it could be as simple as, you know, you're getting pictures of a nice buck every now and then. Well, go back and look. Check the weather when you're getting pictures of those. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I have a journal that I... doing. I have a journal that I... He could just be coming through that spot on a certain wind direction. I think that absolutely happens a lot. Um, There's been, you know, a few different instances where we've seen that happen, and especially with trail cameras. I mean, you know, because it it dictates where he beds. The wind dictates where he beds. It dictates which way he gets up when he out of his bed, which way, what food source he's going to go to, which way he accesses that food source. The same way it should affect us for access, the wind, it also affects the deer for access. A deer is going to live or die by his nose. Without a doubt. The way we use our eyes, that's how they use their nose. Yeah. If you ever notice, whenever you buck or whenever you bump a deer, generally, what's he do? He's gonna try to circle around you. Absolutely, he's gonna try to go down what you are yeah. with his nose. If he doesn't smell it, he's not gonna believe it. You know, he knows something bumped him out, but he's not. He doesn't know what it is. Yep. Until he smells you. Yep. That's a hundred percent, hundred percent right, hundred percent right. Uh, there's uh, just paying attention to those small details means so much. And and uh, you know, I think you know probably some of the people that are listening, they're they're like, well, we we hunt. Um, private ground so how's this going to help us what Jason's talking about and I think the way that I've applied Dan Infault's kind of theories and you know what Jason and I have talked about um, today I've applied it as to know where bucks are going to bed and what direction they might get up and what food source to head to because I typically hunt a lot of food sources or hunt transition areas so you know if if, if you have a certain wind direction where you know a buck's going to bed on a certain ridge or you know a certain marsh or whatever with that wind direction and you know where the closest uh, food source is what's his access to get there you know and try to intercept him there so I think I think it's really relevant for all of us what you're talking about I think it applies specifically more for the for the public land as far as getting super tight to them but uh, the information is super relevant definitely if the one thing 
that I think would apply to private land more than anything is how you get in there and access. It. Absolutely. You know, um, talking about buck bedding and stuff like that, on a lot of farms, you'll find, you know, these big bucks, they're, they're, they're not dumb. But they are predictable about where they're going to bed. And a lot of times what they'll do is they will bed somewhere up next to a thicket, and they know how you access the property. I think I ran into this the first year I hunted my parents' place when they bought it. With that really big deer. With that really big deer. I had pictures of this deer. He was probably, what, 160, 170-inch deer? He was upper 60s for sure. And had pictures of him in daylight every evening, every evening coming out and feeding until I walked back there and tried to hunt him. And what I've learned since then is I'm – I'm pretty sure that deer was bedded somewhere where he was watching my access because I accessed his farm at the same point. And, you know, me driving back there and dropping off corn or something to get pictures of them, minerals, you know. Yeah, in the summer, yeah, in the summer, doing that. Not and then, well, yeah, it's not. And then you're driving back there in a truck right. checking a trail camera because that's what you always did. And I think that that's probably the best way to do it. You were running cameras on the field edges because it's it's almost like a farming practice in some regards. Like those deer aren't. They become accustomed to that, you know. It's not a, it's not a pressure thing. Right. But then, as soon as you as stepped in the woods, as soon as I walked back there, first day I ever walked back there to hunt him, never saw him again. That Gone. was probably the most consistent deer I've ever seen to just disappear. I mean, he was there literally twice a day, every day for three months. Yep. And daylight, like I said, all the way up until the first time I walked back there, and he never showed back up. When was that? October, November. This, this was October. This yeah, was, it was October I had pictures first. of them all the way from June all the way to opening day. And, you know, Wyatt even told me, he said, dude, you're killing that deer opening day. Oh, yeah, I thought he would. And yeah. walked back there, never saw him. Never saw him again. I think I might have got two more pictures of him, and he just gone, vanished. Right, and I mean, and I think like what we talked about, we said, hey, if that deer will hang in after he loses velvet, you're going to kill that deer. Like, that deer's way too predictable. And he stayed just as predictable. He stayed doing the exact same thing the entire month of September. And well, it was October 1st or 2nd, whatever. whatever The first day you could get in there with a decent wind, or at least you thought. Right. You know, um, and that was it. Yep, and I mean, he, he more than likely bedded there watching the access. And this, this, okay, this so thinking back, thinking back, is there anything with the access and things that you have on that on that property? Is there anything else that you could have done differently to maybe had a more positive outcome? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What would you have done? I would have. So, okay, so break down the scenario of, of your access, your previous access point. Because I know, Dave knows, but not everybody else knows, you know, kind of the way the property sets up your access point. And then how would you change that now, thinking about it? Oh, the way the property lays out is um, my parents' house is up there at the front, and then it's probably maybe 40 yards back. To, it's just a big rectangle. Yeah, basically. it's basically like a big rectangle. And they have their house at the front, and it's probably 50 yards from, you know, the back of their barn to the strip of woods and creek that goes through there. And right through the middle of that strip of woods is a road that goes back there where you always drive back there and, you know, gives you access to the backfield. And, you know, it's just a little a little piece of woods, probably not 10 acres. Yeah. And then fence rows all around it. And so what I'd do is I'd just drive and I'd park, and then I would walk right back through the lane and go to wherever I was going to set Go up. right across the creek and then yep. across the field and then. Yep. Now, looking back, what I should have done probably is walked up the road, and then up along the fence line uh, to the, what would that be? Be to your east. Yeah, be, tw be to the east. And just take that and then uh, cut across kind of towards the middle where there's a little strip of woods. And, and a drain branch. and stuff like that. And that would have yep. been your better access point instead of walking straight down the middle. Which, I mean, I think we've all, we, I mean, dude, I know I've done that a hundred times. And I think anybody that deer hunts has done that, you know, several times where... Um, well, and I think I think the big difference is a lot of times we don't understand maybe the impact that we've had because we haven't had a deer maybe quite that predictable as that deer was, you know. So well, what about what about this? And and I don't know. I've not been on the property, uh, but 
would it have been an option or would your stand location been in a, in a position where you could have had, say, Wyatt or, or another friend or even your parents, one of your parents, to drive you back to your stand, leave the truck running, you get out, get in your tree, and then them drive back out, and maybe the deer never be the wiser that you're actually back there. Absolutely. That would have definitely been an option, and I actually thought about that earlier this year. <laughs> but, you know, back then, I don't – I'll be honest. I've learned more just, you know, this year than I – ever thought I would you know I've learned more this year than I you know probably tripled quadrupled my knowledge on deer behavior I don't, I, 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 yes I think that you have learned a lot this year dude it, I run around with a lot of people that deer hunt you're a pretty good deer hunter prior to you know doing some of the public land stuff um, I think that you're learning a different way to hunt you know but I don't I don't think that I don't think that that's fair to yourself I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit as to the type of deer hunter you were before, it's not like you were a bad deer hunter. No, I wasn't a bad. Well, I'd say I got lucky a lot, honestly. Um, well, but, I mean, we, you know, doing that, it honestly, I think it's helped me out tremendously because I know how everyone else hunts, you know. Mm -hmm. And I know how the majority of people on public land are going to hunt. They're going to do just like I've been doing, you know, because uh, I hunted, I hunted public a couple of times last year. Yeah, and you yeah. hunted feeding locations or I travel. I did what everyone else does. Yeah. I parked my truck. I took the trail back. You know, I probably went a little further than most people do. But I took the trail back, and I took a left or I took a right. Yep. Found a tree and climbed up. Yep. Yep. No, that makes sense. So, now you're going, now you're paddling for two hours to go. That, now I'm going where nobody else wants way. to go or can go for that matter. Okay, so you were talking about access there on your private farm there at your parents what's your access uh for some of your public stuff what what's so what explain to us what makes access so important and what are some good access plans how do you want to walk with the with the wind set up you know all that jazz um you know are you are you trying to access by water are you trying to access by a ditch what you know what at what capacity are are you looking for 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 access or good access anytime i can i'm going to try to access by water I feel like that's just a safer bet. It's going to be, you know, you'll be a lot quieter getting in and out. And you're you're, ta you're taking a canoe, too, or a kayak. You went right. and got a... Right, right. I'll, I'll be taking a kayak back in there. But I just, I feel like accessing by water, um, there's not going to be a whole lot of people that even try to do that, you know, just because it's a pain. I oh, mean, yeah. E everywhere I'm going into is, it's miserable getting back there. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you know, snake infested, mosquitoes everywhere. Um but, I mean, that doesn't bother the deer, so why let it bother me, you know? If I can get in there by the river or by a ditch or something, I'm going to do that. If not, then, I mean, I have, you know, a mile, mile and a half walk get back to somewhere. You know, it's just a matter of going back further than anybody else wants to. So, work harder. Yeah, definitely. You definitely yeah. put in put in more effort than All right, so how many, how many days uh, this year have you been out and about and what have you – well, I, or, yeah – Tell us, tell us what you've been up to to acquire all these buck beds. Uh, like, a give lot us of that. Time. Give us a lot of time. Well, yeah, but give us that whole process. What are you doing? Are you looking at maps? Are you any time that I'm not out scouting? Uh, there's a good chance that I have an aerial view open in front of me, either on a computer or on my phone. Um, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of hours I've been looking at maps or actually been out there doing stuff. Um, I try to actually get out and scout at least once or twice a week, and I'm out there for... And you're not scouting the same place over and no, over. You're hitting a not. new spot every new day. spots every time. I'll go in one place and mark it off the list. So, you know, it. You know, there's times, you know, I've been out three different places in a week. Yeah, and I'm sure that I'm sure that you know you said you found you know 60 buck beds or whatever, but gosh, think how many miles and so. Do you have any idea how many miles you've walked? Uh, it's easily a hundred. Okay. Easily. And think about all the spots that I'm sure you've gone into places that have you 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 look at it on a map or whatever, and you're like, oh, well, this might be all right, and you go in and walk, and you're like, nope, that's not going to work. Right. Turn around I've and I've learned hit a lot by doing that, and uh, I mean, this is the point now where if I see an aerial, um, I'd be okay. There's good chance there's gonna be a buck bed right there and i walk back there and there's there's beds right there you know um big deer they're not stupid but at the same time they're predictable they're predictable they're absolutely predictable. you know they're gonna <clears throat> bed in the same type of locations as long as it's conducive to them and they can survive there so okay so you're hunting public what's the main food source for those deer dave if, go before ahead before you even get to that I'd, 
can you break down what you're looking for on those aerials to say, yeah, there's probably going to be a buck bed right there? Absolutely. Um, when I look at an aerial, uh, like I said, this year I've been concentrating a lot on wetlands. Um, marshes, swamps, anything like that. Um, and in those spots, you know, you're looking for the high spots. You know, you can generally on aerial pick out where there's trees out in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Or a little point coming out of the woods with trees on it, islands, anything like that. If a deer's surrounded by water, there's not going to be hardly anything that can get to them. You know, like, like I said, you know, when's the last time you saw a coyote out in a marsh or anything like that? There's really no predators out there and they feel safe so as long as they have a spot of dry ground they can lay down on that's where they'll be all right so what what's your what you're not really hunting food sources i mean you're hunting you're specifically hunting bedding Correct. but obviously you're a long way from any agricultural fields or anything actually like no that. no not, not as okay. far as you think okay um there's some places where there's ag fields you know within you know a quarter mile Really? Okay, it's just impossible to access. It's just, yeah, you're, you're, you've got to cross, cross across a ditch or something to get to them. Okay, okay. So you think that that's those deer's main food source. Have you thought anything about, like, riding around and shining or something at night, you know, like shining those ag fields or anything like that? Absolutely, I have. Yeah, and, you know, or glassing those in the summer, whatever. Right. You know, and then is that going to is that gonna play in, is that going to be a factor in your fall hunting? It's honestly probably not. Um, I mean, I'll do it. But at the same time, you know, I'm not going to let that determine if I hunt that spot or what not. What about trail cameras? I have thought about that. Um, I've got is the risk that. not worth the reward? Yeah, is the risk not worth the well, reward? Well, if I put a camera up, I'm taking a climbing stick with me, and I'm going to put it up probably 10 feet. So. Well, I'm not just talking about other people oh, taking it. I'm talking about just blowing, like... Blowing the spot out? Yeah, I mean, because one, you're going out there, you're putting the camera out. Two... Uh, it's a completely and totally foreign object to where, you know, those deer aren't accustomed to cameras whatsoever. I mean, my, you know, our deer over here on, on private ground, I mean, they're pretty accustomed to them at this point. The majority of, well, all of them actually have lived with cameras in their life. Their entire life, they have seen a camera from right. the time they were a fawn, you know, to the time they're however old. I mean, we've been running cameras for, you know, 12 or 15 years. So, you know, that's not really... That right. had, that's, I mean, that, that's that's, that's a non-factor with us. Yeah, I mean, that you know, is something we don't to think about. I I haven't put anything out. Um, I have thought about it, but I'm I'm honestly kind of where you were as far as number one. It's something they're really not used to. Right. Um, if I do put one out, like I said, it's going to be about ten feet up, looking down. So I right. Really, I well, and that and the, and that will keep it out of right the deer's yeah, peripheral. Gonna, yeah, yeah gonna and stuff like keep that. Keep it out so, of sight, yeah. out of mind. Um, if I do do it, it's going to be at a time when it is either raining or getting ready to rain to keep my scent down. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's going to have to be the right wind. It's going to have to be the right wind. I mean, and where would you where would you place that camera? I mean, obviously you're not going to I, put it on a bed, but yeah, where would you put not, it on a transition? Bed, um, probably the edge of the marsh where it meets up to the woods. Yeah, just put it on a transition area there. Yeah, kind of a transitional area right there. Um, so I'm assuming that those deer in those marshes, I'm, I would assume, just thinking about, for example, like flatwoods and stuff like that, and say like part of it's been logged and part of it's, you know, big old timber, you know, those deer will really run that edge, you know, that edge of uh, grown up thistle or, or you know, a honeysuckle or, uh, you know, briars or whatever, just that thick edge there. I'm assuming that those deer in the marsh will probably run the edge of the marsh. Absolutely. And that's when I'm is scouting, that's, is that what, right? that's what I'm scouting generally, is just walking the transition area right there around where the marsh butts up to the woods, whether there be any red brush or dog woods, whatever there is in there. And is that where you're planning on, I'm assuming that's probably more where you're planning on setting up is kind of on that transition area as opposed to actually, say there's an island out in the middle, you're not going to be able to access that island either without it that deer catching. The, there's a few islands out there that are actually big enough for me to get up in there. Okay. And that'll put me right about where I want to be. Okay. For that, I mean, you know, within 60 yards of that bed. Okay. Okay. Or is there specific conditions that you're looking for to hunt some of those tighter areas? Do you want it windy or rainy or something like that to help cover your noise? I'd, I'd love to have it windy and rainy every day, 
but yeah, yeah you know uh, it's just not going to happen so i mean honestly what's going to happen is i'm going to have to really take down as much brush as i can until i get within a few hundred yards and then slow way down to a snail's pace you know really yeah. take your time getting in there and just one step at a time all right so explain uh what type of you know obviously a climber is not going to work in every scenario it probably will in some but uh what type of stand and stuff are you running i'm running uh xlp vanish and i've got the same sticks and you did a rope mod on those i did yes i did I so did explain that mod. a little bit uh rope mods basically you're taking the cam buckle system off of them uh the straps and cam buckles and you're just running a piece of eight millimeter accessory cord around it and uh you can just tie them in like that and that thing is just as solid as your cam straps and you don't have to worry about buckles hitting together and it shaves a few pounds off of it and you know <laughs> as far as i'm going to be going weight is everything yeah no doubt no doubt well and i think i think as close as you're going to be getting to those deer and stuff getting rid of those buckles is huge right have you thought anything about like getting some sort of do you have like a um oh gosh like millennium makes it muddy made some it's like a bracket that you hang the quick connect bracket yeah quick connect bracket or something i do not have any i am thinking about getting some um i know they have been out of stock um for the past six months so i haven't got my hands on any but they should be coming in this summer okay and uh i'm definitely i'm gonna get some and try it out and see if i like it better if i don't then i'm just gonna run it the way it is okay you know i've i've used those like on some muddies and some uh, millenniums and stuff that we have make it a heck of a lot easier and a heck of a lot safer hanging a tree stand and really i think it makes it quieter too because you're not wrestling that tree stand near as much you're dropping it in and then you're running a strap around the bottom portion of the stand but that's so much quieter and easier than you know beating around with the ratchet strap or what which i know like on that on the xop it's got like a pull strap right. as opposed to a ratchet and you definitely want to want to ratchet with what you're doing but, I mean, you know, just still, I mean, it's still a metal component. Right. That can swing around, you know, freely. So, no, that's good info, dude. That's pretty interesting. So, so yeah, uh, I'm get, just being as mobile as I can. You know, like I said, I'm not going to hunt the same setup day in, day out. You know, I'm going to definitely be moving around. So, at, at any point... I mean, I don't know if you've thought this far ahead, but let's just say uh, you get in and you're kind of going through that grind. I mean, are you planning on hunting your your private ground any at all this year? I am. Um, I was just telling Wyatt earlier, you know, um, I'm probably going to throw one set at it earlier in the year um, and then maybe one or two during the rut, but the majority of my time is going to be spent on public this year. What about cameras and stuff? I'm assuming that you'll probably run cameras on your private and just check to see if there's a bit shooter and if a shooter shows up, if there's a shooter living there, then you're going to... I mean, you had last year on your folks' place, man, you had that one really nice... What was he, an 8 or a 9? He was real wide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he made it. Did he make it through? Yeah. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. I, th- I thought uh, that I think he did. All of my all of my shooter bucks actually made it through the year. Yeah, um, on your private. So, Golly, I mean, listen to that, dude. I mean, you had several different shooter I, I, bucks. You've completely and totally abandoned that, and you're saying I'm going all in. I like that. I like that. <laughs> go big or go home, man. Go no. Go big or go home. Well, I mean, okay, uh, I think Steve Ranella talks about his brother or something, Matt. I listen to several of their podcasts and shows and stuff like that. I kind of follow Ranella. I think he's pretty cool. Um, but his, his, uh, his brother talks about a purity score of a hunt. And, like, you know, you weigh in a bunch of different factors. You know, was it a guided hunt? Was it a was self-guided hunt? Were you on public land? Were you hunting with a bow? Were you hunting with a gun? You know, all this different stuff. And it, and it, and it all adds up to be a higher purity score. Like, the you know. So I think, I think that public land stuff, that's probably as much of it as anything. It's that challenge. It's that, hey, I can do this, too. I'm just as good. I can do this. And, uh, you know, that would, that would uh, really amp up your purity score by doing that yes but i mean that's really that's not why i'm doing i don't think it's i don't i i I don't think i'm better than anybody else out there no i don't i don't mean that i I don't mean personally i'm just Um, i I guess like for me my thing to to want to kill something on a public land would be to prove it to myself that i can do that too right you know i can see that for me, honestly, you know, if I didn't do it, I feel I feel like that I have a lot better odds of shooting a mature buck. 
then a lot just, of people won't say that. Well, I, true, but <laughs> no, I, I, and I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with like, you. I'm just saying like, that's I just, good. I feel like I do because I'll be hunting so many different spots instead of the same one over and over. Yeah. Well, it'll you make for a more fun season, too. Exactly. I mean, you're not constantly staring at the same oak tree. Exactly. Now, given, I will say there are, you know, at my private properties, there are some deer that I think are going to be absolute hammers this year. And it's going to be really hard not to get in there and hunt them, especially being out there on public, not really knowing what all is out there. Yeah. You know, that deer we were talking about um, the first year at my parents, that one sixties buck that got away. Um you know, you saw pictures of that one deer from last year that looks just like that deer, except mm-hmm. a little smaller. And I think this year he yeah he was be, three last year. He was three four, last year. Yeah. He's gonna be four this year. So I he think he's a, gonna be he should really he's blow be up the twin of that one. Yep. To me, that brings up an interesting question. That I so this is something that obviously anybody can do. I mean, everybody, I don't care where you're at, you're going to have some public access ground somewhere close to you, whether you're in Indiana, Ohio, whatever state you're in. You know, there's a ton of it out west. But let's just say uh, a guy has, a guy like me, I, you know, I've got a, I've got some uh, a few different properties I have permission to hunt, but they're all smaller parcels. Not every year do I have a target deer or something I want to harvest on those properties. I mean, so there's going to be some years where you know, maybe I just, I, you know, I'll hunt just in case I get a roamer buck come through, you know, during the rut or something. But oftentimes I may not have a deer that, that I feel like is something that I want to harvest. On years like that, whenever, let's say, a guy goes through, you know, he's going into the first part of the season and he doesn't locate an animal that he wants to hunt on his private ground, is this something that he can start, like, first week of September or something and say, oh, I don't think I have a deer to hunt that I want to harvest. So I'm going to start looking at my public ground, and can he at that point start analyzing these maps and come up with a plan, or is he way too far behind to get started? I'd say you're never too far behind to get started. Um, I will say this, uh, that late in the year, um, I definitely would not put boots on the ground, go in there scouting. Um, you know, I would definitely do it all cyber scouting. You know, getting getting on my Google Maps or Bing or, you know, your OnX or whatever map source you use and try to pick out the spots to check out. And, yeah, definitely, definitely don't go in there boots on the ground scouting. Um, that close to season, you're really going to do more harm than good. Um, if there are any good bucks in there, you're probably going to push them out that close to season, especially if you're in there looking for their beds. Um, but, you know, yeah, definitely just get on the, get on your maps and uh, search for – you know, what you think is going to be a good spot, you know, where you think they might be bedding. You might be completely wrong, but, you know, go in there, do an observation set, and just see what you see. Okay, so here, here's something. You get, just talking to you today here, it's kind of got my wheels turning a little bit. So a guy like myself that for the last three or four years have been saying, I'm going to go hunt in Ohio. Yeah, just because it's close to us, um, I feel like they're pretty fair with uh, – you know the uh, non-resident tags they've got a a lengthy season uh, pretty good opportunity a lot of big deer over there why in the world am I not being proactive and looking into Ohio and just going over and spending um, a day a week walking some public grounds in Ohio that's a question you ask yourself you know I don't I mean, but but basically what you're doing can be replicated anywhere. Anywhere, anywhere, absolutely anywhere. I mean, there, that's one great thing, um, you know, about this country is there's so many areas with public land. Like you said, you know, you're never probably more than an hour or two away from somewhere you can just go hunt. You know, you don't have to have permission or anything like that. Go out there, walk around, see what you see. I mean, if nothing else, it just gets you outside, you know. Yeah, I would say this, though. It's something that we need to make sure we mention to everybody. Make sure you check out in the public grounds are open to hunting because there are some public grounds that, that you know there may be state parks or something like that that uh, you can't have access to hunt in or anything like that so it is that that's the properties that Campbell's looking at right now like I say you got to go where nobody else is those hundreds of miles and hundreds of hours spent have been wasted Campbell <laughs> you did say you were looking for somewhere no one else has been right <laughs> that's why I don't see any tree stand signs <laughs> oh no man I'm uh, I'm kidding but uh I don't know, Whitey. You got anything else, or? Yeah. 
I'm sure. I'm sure by uh, by doing this, and, and I think one of the most appealing things to what to what you're doing is, I'm sure that you feel kind of like Dave was saying, you know, like, ah, well, maybe I could go to Ohio and find some public land to hunt. I'm sure that you would feel probably a lot more confident in yourself and your abilities of uh, finding stuff and finding stuff quickly than maybe people like Dave and I who, you know, know how to hunt our farms, but we're maybe not getting the whole big picture like you are and have that approach of honey beds and things like that. Um, speak on that, Campbell. Like if I said, if we just started driving right now and say season was in and we stopped in some random state on some public land, how fast could you get on a deer? <sighs> Just going in in the middle of season? Yeah, middle of season, no scouting, looking at aerial maps and stuff like that. And just, I mean, what do you, I mean, what do you think? I mean, don't you feel more confident now on being able to do I guess that's what I'm getting at. Oh, don't definitely. you feel more confident now being able to do that than maybe you did a year ago or two years ago or three years ago? You know, <laughs> With, it, without a doubt, without a doubt. And uh, in all honesty, I think I could probably be on a mature buck in – two to three days you know if not the first day just by looking at aerials and you know the terrain and stuff you know it all and also it depends on the type of terrain you're talking about right yeah absolutely of course it does all right so say you tag out in the first couple weeks here in indiana um do you have plans of uh uh taking dave and showing him what to do in ohio uh, maybe hey, going, I'm ready. We can leave right now and go check out some land if you want to, buddy. Or go to go to Kentucky or something like that. I have actually. I've thought. Of, I have seriously considered going down to Kentucky and trying to find some public ground down there just to just have something to do in September. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, that makes perfect. Sense. Say, I've got a. I've got. I've got that whole month before. Uh, before a season opens here in indiana yeah and you're wanting to stay out of the woods and stuff that month anyways so. right um honestly as far as that goes you know this is probably gonna be my last month of scouting i've got i've got two other places that i want to go check out and after that then i'm probably going to be out of the woods when did you okay when did you start scouting uh, later than i should have um i started back in march and um i really wish i'd have went in there january the day after season ended yeah yeah Makes sense. Yeah, so, but I mean, but still, March is a pretty big jump on most everybody else. Right, right. And I think that's a mistake a lot of people make is their scouting doesn't start until September yeah. around here. You know, Absolutely, they, yeah. They go in the month before, maybe even a week or two before, and start hanging their stands and doing scouting then. Yep. And at that point, you know, they're they're pushing deer out. And, and to, you know, to your credit um, – Starting in March or anything, I, I know a lot of guys around here, me, myself, I'm completely guilty of that. I spend a ton of time looking for sheds on properties that I can hunt on private ground instead of being proactive and getting out and finding some new ground to hunt, maybe on public. So, I mean, that's something maybe that, uh, you know, guys ought to be doing. Like, you know, like you said, as soon as season ends, you can start that homework on public ground where you don't want to even go shed hunting yet, even though there may be some drops down. Because you don't want to blow deer off your property before they shed. You know? That's a great thing about public land, man. You go out there, do your shed hunting early if you want to, you know, while you're scouting around. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, and, and you know, it takes people that maybe can't do food plots and, you know, they're wanting to stay out of their private ground just like you. I mean, you don't have access to be able to put in food plots. You don't want to be on your or on your private ground, um, you know, every week or anything like that. It gives It gives you the opportunity to be 365. Yeah, definitely and you know it's this has been the best year i've ever had so far and it's you know i attribute that to being out being able to get out there every single day if i want to right and you know i'm I'm fortunate enough where you know i've got a job i've only got to work three days a week so that gives me four days to go running around in swamps you know get, yeah. getting nasty yeah. looking around for deer yeah yeah that's not bad okay so here's probably my final question to kind of wrap things up i guess what do you think, and this really has nothing to do with public or private or anything else, but what do you think the most important thing that we can do as hunters to um, continue to give us an opportunity to pursue um, and live this you know, outdoor lifestyle? Get more people involved. As simple as that. You know, number, the number of hunters has been going down consistently here lately past several years and you know with less hunters out there you know and this goes for public land especially i mean if you don't have hunters buying tags and doing things like that you know putting money towards conservation officer right. effort you know the amount of land that we have access to is going to go down absolutely well i mean that's already 
happening some. Right. You know, so. Um, okay. All right. Well, that's good info, man. Everything, I think, today has been really good info, and especially, I think it's been encouraging, and I think it gives us all, you know, something to look forward to um, and and something to do if we want to continue to, you know, be whitetail guys and, and get out, and maybe we're trying to stay out of uh, some of our, our best spots. It gives us an opportunity to go in and uh, chase deer around or look for deer sign and everything, scout around on, on some places where we're not quite as concerned about screwing up and and uh, really give us an opportunity to skip around and be in the game 100% of the time, not just, you know, like I was talking earlier. I mean, you know, I might hunt 30 days, but five of those days are, I'm, you know, I'm actually in the chips. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, just, it, you, I'm not going to say you have a higher higher percentage opportunity, but it just, it gives yep. you the chance to, you know, well, be yeah, in and, there. And, well, and I think, too, if you have the confidence, um, if you have the confidence in where you're at and what you're doing, you're a heck of a lot better hunter because you're so much more aware of what's going on. Right. And you're so much more vigilant and reading sign and watching, you know, if say you have a doe come up, watching watching her behavior or fawn or, or whatever else, you know, listen to the blue jays, you know, when a deer <laughs> walks by and starts, you know, chirping and stuff like that, you know, listen to the squirrel, whatever else. That's kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier and being vigilant in the woods and paying attention to what um, all the, all the animals are doing and what those critters are doing and asking the question why why did that deer do that why did this bird do that why is that bird making a noise over there to our left you know things like that I, I, that just you know that all falls back into woodsmanship and and you know being better woodsmen and, and understanding the way that uh animals travel and their behaviors and things like that i, I eat it all up dude i, I like it doesn't get much better man no all right Dave, what do you want to you want to close her out for us? I just want to say that I'm uh, I'm a little disappointed in you all. I was expecting Donnie Baker to call in today, but that didn't happen. <laughs> Donnie Baker, we haven't hit the big time yet, Campbell. It's uh, one of these days maybe we can get Donnie Baker on here, but uh, I'm not too sure what he's going to have to say about <laughs> about uh, about hunting or anything like that. But uh, but man, hey, been a pleasure. Uh, I know. Um, I haven't known you near the time that uh, that old Wyatt here has, but uh, I feel like you're you're an old friend already, and uh, and I'm already learning stuff from you, man. I uh, I appreciate you coming on and sharing some knowledge, and uh, and I'm gonna take you up on that, and go to Ohio, and we're gonna find us somewhere to shoot something over there. Hey, I'm ready, man. I got I got plenty of time off. Just let me know. But uh, seriously, thanks for having me on here, guys. It's been a blast. All right, man. Well, there you go. There's another episode of uh, Diving Deep Pro Talk Style in the book. So. Uh, we will uh, catch you later.